Bibles this morning, would you turn with me, please? Thank you, singers and musicians. Praise the Lord. Turn with me, please, to the book of St. Luke. Paul called him the beloved physician. Luke wrote the book that bears his name. He wrote the great book of Acts as well. Some believe he may have been one of the 70 who followed Jesus. Some think he was a Gentile. Some think he was one of the two on the road to Emmaus after Jesus rose from the dead, Cleophas the other one. But irrespective, he was used of God mightily. He alone recorded this tremendous illustration given by Christ, of which I read only a tiny portion of it. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And I want to use for a subject, speaking a few minutes today, hell is no joke. Hell is no joke. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus today, we thank you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to preach this word that you have given unto us this engrafted word that's able to save our souls. Anoint the people, we cry, we pray as well, to hear and receive. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, and everyone said amen and amen. My whole family came to the Lord with the exception of a few aunts and uncles of which I am aware when this great gospel came to us back in 1940. My grandmother was one of the godliest women I ever knew, which Francis can attest to as well. She was a woman of phenomenal faith. She would even at times stop me while I was praying because I had a prayer meeting when Francis and I first married. I would go over to her house every afternoon after getting off from work and we would have a prayer meeting. And sometimes she would stop me right in the middle of my praying and tell me, son, you're not praying right. <laughs> and tell me how to pray. And I remember so many things about her, but one in particular, she grounded into my spirit. She said, Jimmy, God is a big God, so ask big. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. He's a big God, so ask big. Her sister was unsaved. Her husband, her sister's husband, they put in a restaurant and gambling was legal then in our parish. And my uncle had a row of slot machines in that restaurant. And my grandmother, that was his, her brother-in-law, she was speaking to him one day about his soul because she was praying for her sister. I don't know that her sister ever did give her heart to Christ. But she was constantly witnessing to both of them. And one day she was talking to my uncle. 
And by now, he was quite wealthy. He drove the finest automobiles that money could buy. He dressed in the very finest suits of clothes that money could buy. She was speaking with him this day about his soul as only my grandmother could. And finally, she said to him rather bluntly, Harvey, these slot machines are going to take you to hell. Now, that's a blunt statement. It pulls no punches. The Holy Spirit through her had her to get to the very heart of the matter. For money was my uncle's God. And he looked at her and said, I will go to hell before I give up my slot machine. That's what he said. I will go to hell before I give up my slot machines. About three months later, the county voted an ordinance of no gambling, and they hauled those slot machines out one by one and broke them up with broad axes. About three months after that, my uncle dropped dead with a heart attack. When my aunt, my, my aunt, my grandmother got the word that her brother-in-law had a heart attack, they got him to the hospital. She rushed there as quickly as she could, fighting to try to get there. And when she walked in, they said, Mrs. Swaggart, it's too late. He died on the way in the ambulance to the hospital. That has been about 65 years ago. My uncle, sad to say, horrifyingly to say, unless at the last moment he had time to cry to God, and there is no knowledge if he did or didn't. But if not, and more than likely he did not, he's been in hell now for some 60, 65 years. And he will be there forever and forever. When God created man, he created man, spirit, soul, and body. The Bible said that God breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. That means you are a soul which is eternal. You have a spirit which is eternal. Your soul and your spirit, which are indivisible, meaning they cannot be separated, even though they are different, lives in a tabernacle called the physical body. Whereas the physical body will wear out and ultimately, upon death, go back to dust. The soul and the spirit of every human being is alive right now, either in heaven or hell. Now let me say that again. You have eternity in your heart. You're not just a piece of ectoplasm, and the child in the womb is not a fetus or a blob. You can change the name, but it doesn't change the reality. At the moment of conception, it is a human being. And that human being will live forever 
and forever. I'm 74 years young. And yet it seems like some of the things I did when I was a child just happened a short time ago. Life is like, as somebody said, the stay of the postman at the door. He's there and then he's gone. Life is like the sun that rises and then it sets. There is so little distance between the cradle and the coffin, so little time between our good mornings and our good night, so little time between our hellos and our goodbyes. But when we think of eternity, our human mind cannot, cannot grasp it forever and forever. A thousand years, a million years, a billion years, a trillion years, forever. Your soul and your spirit, right now at this moment, most of the population that has ever lived from the time of Adam until now, and I don't say this with gladness because there is no joy in heaven over the death of the wicked, but most are in hell. Most are in hell. You see, only a few are in heaven. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be who find it. Think of that. Every soul who has ever lived is either in heaven or hell at this moment and fully conscious. Now, Jesus himself gave us the most chilling account, the most graphic account of life after death that anyone in, ever gave, including the prophets of old. And Ezekiel, Isaiah had much to say about this, but Jesus in one illustration, and some have tried to pass it off and say it was just a parable, just a story. Oh no, he called names in this illustration. And he never did that with parables. And I realize that today, that most of the pulpits in this nation and around the world and Christendom do not even believe there is such a place called hell. More than likely at this moment, there are so few sermons right now in America being preached on this subject. If you would ask the preacher, most would say, well, maybe there's a hell, but it's not literal. Others would say, yes, there's a hell, but it's here in this life. There may be hell in this life, but that's not the hell Jesus was talking about. Well, how do you know there is a hell? How do you know there is a heaven? To use reverse, to go up instead of down. How do you know there is a city built four square? How do you know the walls are of jasper? The gates are of solid pearl. How do you know the streets are made of gold? How do you know that there is a place called heaven? How do I know there is a place called hell? Because this Bible says that it is. Because the Bible says that it is. I believe the word of God. Every word from in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth to the last word in Revelation 22, 17. I believe it all. Man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus said, but by every word that proceeds 
out of the mouth of God. There was a man who was rich. There was a beggar who was named Lazarus. Jesus did not call the name of the rich man. And he did it or didn't do it because of relatives or loved ones or others who were left. Our Lord is always cognizant of the feelings of people. Whatever he said about that rich man or about Lazarus didn't really matter. They were dead. The man was rich. Lazarus, on the other hand, was poverty stricken. You have to understand the Jewish thinking of that time. The Jews thought that if a man or a woman were rich, that was the blessing of God. Now, it may be, but not necessarily so. And they thought if someone was in the state of Lazarus poor, much less a beggar, that that was the curse of God on him. And Jesus turned their theology inside out, upside down. When he says the material, financial, economical, physical status of the person has nothing to do with their soul. Did you get that? You can have a PhD in quantum physics. And if you don't know Christ, you don't know how to live. You can have a PhD in humanistic psychology, but if you do not know Jesus Christ, you do not know how to live. You can have a PhD in whatever field of endeavor you choose but if you don't know Christ I said across the table once and I too will be circumspect I will not call a name from one of the members and I won't even call the president of the president of the United States a member of his cabinet I said across the table from him I suggested to him that he write a certain thing in the president's speech that was to be delivered that night to America, and he wrote it exactly as I asked him to. He was brilliant. He committed suicide. When I read it in the paper not so long ago, His social status, his physical status, his economic status did not save his soul. I'm trying to get you to understand something. You can be rich and be saved. You can be rich and be lost. You can be in poverty and be saved. You can be in poverty and be lost. And the Bible said that Lazarus hoped to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. I have no doubt that this rich man was proud with himself that he gave Lazarus some crumbs. Are you hearing me? I want to ask a question this morning. Let me be as prayerfully to say it right so you won't misunderstand. I know a few people who are wealthy, only a few, who are generous with their finances, with the work of God. Do you follow me? I know some. It's not many. But I know some who are wealthy. 
and they do not give God crumbs. They are generous with his work. I know a lot of rich people as well who claim to be saved, and maybe they are. I'm not questioning their salvation, but all they give God are crumbs. You follow me? And they think, aren't I doing something wonderful? I knew a very wealthy man once. He's now with the Lord. He came to the Lord under this ministry. And he was a great help to this ministry. And I loved him like a brother. And I want to emphasize that. He was a great help to this ministry. But he didn't do near what he could have done. And not even impacted him at all. I was talking with him one day. In one business deal, he had just lost $2 million. Now, maybe to you, that's pocket change, but that's a lot of money to me. He had lost $2 million. We were discussing it. He shrugged his shoulders and said, oh, I'll just write it off. I'll just write it off. And he did, and he should have. But when he said it, I figured it up. He had not given to the work of God in the 10 years I knew him, or 15, that much money, $2 million, as he lost in that one business deal. But if you would have asked him, he would have thought, oh man, I support the work of God greatly. But according to what he had, he wasn't and didn't. And now, now, the millions that he made, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 millions of dollars, are being thrown away. I mean, literally pitched out in the yard, thrown away. Am I getting through to you? That's why Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven where thieves cannot break, break through and steal and where moths do not corrupt and rust does not canker it. Somebody ought to hear what I'm saying. And I'll say it the opposite direction. It's not what you would do with riches should millions ever be your lot, but what you're doing at present with a dollar and a quarter you got. Hallelujah. Are you giving God crumbs? You need to answer that question. Are you giving God crumbs? I want the Holy Spirit to take that word down deep in your heart. And I don't want you to misunderstand. I am grateful for every dollar that's given for the work of God. And some of you are doing all that you can do. But I want to ask, are you doing all you can do? Are you giving God crumbs? Desiring to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And he died. Lazarus. Full of sores. Begging for a living. Why he was in this state, I cannot answer that. I don't know. What happened to him that this was his lot? I do not know that. But in the final analysis, ever how long Lazarus lived, I don't know how long it was, 40 years, 50, 60, 70, whatever it was. It's long since past. He's in heaven today. 
and he'll be there forever and forever. Are you getting the contrast? Are you understanding whatever it was on this earth he didn't have? That, that was, that's a sorrowful thing. And I, I, I ache when I read about him in the 16th chapter of Luke. But in comparison to eternity, what was it? Nothing. And when he died, considering that the Jewish theology of that day thought, well, he has the curse of God on him. No doubt his body was taken to the potter's field where those who died were buried who had no financial means to have a reasonable funeral. And probably they put his remains and nobody was there. No one was there in a little wooden coffin and wrapped it and walked away. But even though you could not see it with the eye, Jesus said, angels came down. <laughs> Angels came down. It said the plural, angels. Not just one, but I don't know, two, five, ten. They thought enough of Lazarus because his soul was saved. And they came down and accompanied his soul and his spirit to paradise. Somebody ought to get happy. Praise God. Praise God. I see this young man's uniform here. I have a great respect for the military. If God hadn't have called me to preach, I would have probably wound up in the military because I respect it. I respect the spit and the polish. I respect the comradesmanship. I respect from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We'll fight our nation's battles on the land and on the sea. You see the picture. You saw it just a few days ago, June the 6th. Bringing back to our memory, and rightly so, the landings in Normandy, June the 6th, 1944. I walked through that graveyard where over 9,000 American boys are buried who died the first two days. Omaha Beach, Sword Beach, Juno Beach. I walked through those graves lives cut short. They never had the opportunity to live as I have lived and you have lived. In the prime of life, and I don't like Colin Powell too much, but I'll always remember one thing he said, which was gloriously right. He said, this nation has spilled its blood in country after country of the world to set men free. And we've never asked one thing of any country except a little land to bury our dead. And I wondered as I walked through those crosses, some few of them with the star of David on them, how many were saved when they died, but I'll guarantee you that far more of them, that their physical body's already gone back to dust, even though that stone is sticking there. When they were facing German Nazi shot and shell, that more of them than didn't cried to God. 
for grace and mercy. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 A little bit inland among the hedgerows, an American boy was hit among thousands. He couldn't get up. He tried to and he couldn't. He was in a slight depression. Blood was flowing. He was trying to stop it. And a German jumped into that foxhole and saw it was an American and picked up his rifle with a bayonet to thrust it through him. And that American boy said, oh, help me, Jesus, help me. And that German slowly put down his rifle and in broken English said, my mother was a Christian. She knew Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And he tended his wounds and bandaged him up. And I don't know if he's alive today or not, but that's what the world needs. It's Jesus. Just one glimpse of him. Angels came and took the soul and the spirit of Lazarus to paradise. I want you to get that. The moment a child of God dies, I don't care who they are, what the color of the skin might be, their status in this world or the lack thereof. Angels came and come and take them home to glory. Oh, glory to God. Praise, praise the Lord. 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 Now, I've gotten just about a third way through this message, but I've run out of time. And I'll finish it next Sunday morning unless Jesus comes. I think it was 19... It must have been about 19... 91 or two, something like that. I was coming to the office that morning. That's before Sun Life Radio. And I turned to the news on some station here, radio. I remember I'd pulled up to McDonald's to get some breakfast or something. And the announcer said, two very notable Americans died this week, African Americans. One was Thurgood Marshall, the first African American Supreme Court Justice, passed away this week. But this was not a gospel program. That it had nothing to do with the gospel. It was not a gospel newscast. And he said, the other African American who passed away was Tommy Dorsey. I listened. He said, Thurgood Marshall, as the first Supreme Court justice of this nation, that was African-American, crossed barriers that were impossible to cross, but he did, and set an example for millions of other African-Americans. But he said, Tommy Dorsey, influenced and affected in a positive sense the whole world That's right. That's right. because Tommy Dorsey wrote the song precious Lord That's it. That's it. take my hand 
and lead me on. Hallelujah. He walked into his wife's bedroom. She was sick. Their first baby was about to be born. He was asked to go sing in St. Louis. He lived in Chicago. And he wrestled with it and got out of the room after kissing her goodbye and went back again and kissed her one more time. Their first child was almost ready to be born. He went to St. Louis. When he sang that night, he said, there was an unusual anointing. And the people wouldn't let him stop. He just kept singing the refrain, course after course. And he sat down. And somebody handed Tommy Dorsey a telegram. And it said, Reverend Dorsey, we're sorry to inform you like this, but your wife, and your baby both died a few hours ago. He buried them both in one casket, and it liked to have killed him. He thought, Lord, I don't think I can stand it. I don't want to live. If I had stayed, I would have been with her when she died, and maybe I could have done something that she not died. And it almost pulled him to the place that he was unable to function. And he sat down to the piano. And it just began to come to him. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on. Help me stand, I am weak, I am tired, thou art strong. Through the day, through the night, lead me on by your might, take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, the man was right. When Tommy Dorsey died, he said, Thurgood Marshall affected this country. Tommy Dorsey touched the world. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Can you sing it, please? Precious Lord. Take my hand. Take my hand. Lead me on. Lead me on. Help me stand. Help me stand. I'm, I'm tired. tired. I'm tired. I am weak. I Francis and the brethren and Karen, I want you to come, please. I want you to stand right here. Listen to me. If that rich man that, I, that Jesus told about could be here this morning, he would run down these aisles 
and he will tell you whatever you do, make Jesus the Lord of your life and the Savior of your soul. Because you see, there are no unbelievers in hell. I'm going to ask him to sing it one more time. And if you are not positive or sure of your soul's salvation, I want you to step out and I want you to come and stand here for these brethren or these ladies. You'd better be sure. You'd better be certain. I'm not asking you to join our church. I'm asking you to make it right with God. I want you to come, precious Lord. Take my hand. Spirit has told me to say this, that there are some in this place, I don't know who you are, I don't know where you stand, but the Spirit of God is dealing with you. He's told me, tell them that they're going to sing it one more time, and you can't afford to throw this aside. Too much is at stake. Your eternal soul is at stake. And as they sing it, I want you to step out. I want to say it again. We will not embarrass you, I promise. We're not here to get you to join our church. We're here that you might make things right with God. Come on right now as they sing it. Precious Lord. Come on right now. I want about another 50 or 75 believers to come stand behind these good people. Please, can I get you to come? I want you to look at Brother Swaggart, please. 
I want you to look at me, and I want you to listen to me very carefully. God loves you. I want you to know that. He loves you. Your name is on this service. Right now, the Lord is poised in heaven to write your name down in the Lamb's book of life. I'm going to pray. I want you to say it after me. A long time ago, the Lord told me, said, don't take it for granted that people know how to pray. A lot of them don't. You pray for them and let them pray with you. And if they will believe it, I will save them. <laughs> if they will believe it, I will save you. Now bow your heads, please, and let us pray. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. The way I've lived. The way I've lived. The things I've done. The things I've done. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. With your precious blood. With your precious blood. From all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. With my mouth, with my mouth, I confess, I confess the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, in my heart, in my heart, I believe, I believe that God raised Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, from the dead, and He's alive, and He is alive right now, right now, this moment, this moment. I accept Jesus Christ. I accept Jesus Christ as the Savior of my soul. As the Savior of my soul. And I make him. And I make him the Lord of my life. The Lord of my life. And according to God's word. And according to God's word. This very moment. This very moment. I'm washed. I'm washed. I'm cleansed. I'm cleansed. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I am saved. I am saved. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Turn around and love somebody. Welcome them into the family. Well, I'm saved by love divine. Glory, glory. Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. No I'm redeemed. Sun Life Broadcasting Network.